Hey, good evening. Uh, tonight we are talking uh, about the Israelite reign, the thousand year Israelite reign. Uh, this is part of the mapping the end of days um, series that we've been doing um, on our blog. And um, tonight's topic is interwoven with um, end of days teaching. Uh, it has a lot to do with um, what comes after uh, what's called Jacob's Trouble. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about um, what's coming because there's, you know, there's talk about the Antichrist, there's talk about the tribulation period, there's talk about um, so many things. And, you know, there's this, this is the end goal um, for the kingdom of Jacob. And so I want you to have a better understanding of, of what this means. Okay, so. The restoration of Israel is recorded throughout the Bible in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is a promise linked to the Davidic covenant. Now, you can find out about the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and in 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14, as well as 2 Chronicles 6, 16. Uh, this is a covenant where the Most High promised that a descendant of David would reign on the throne over the people over his people indefinitely. Uh, it is a continuation of the earlier covenants in that it promises a Davidic king as the figure through whom the Most High would secure the promises of the land, descendants, and blessings. Now, there are five covenants total. Uh, these can be found in the Old Testament. Three have been fulfilled, but two haven't. So there's the Noahic covenant found in Genesis 9:11. The Abrahamic covenant found in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Mosaic covenant found in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, and then finally the Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7, 12 through 17, and the new covenant found in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And so the new covenant is in progress. Um, Christ actually came and actually started the new covenant. So the new covenant is in, is in progress because we now have the Holy Spirit that dwells within, within inside of us. Um, however, the new covenant is not completely finished. And so you have the Davidic covenant and the new covenant that is still uh, has to be fulfilled. And so that, that's what this is all about. Now in Jeremiah chapter 30, uh, verses 1 through 11, uh, we get a description of Jacob's trouble, which uh, is most more commonly known as uh, the Great Tribulation. And so um, in this passage, um, it's it's promised, you know, Adonai promises to, to rescue and to restore Israel and those grafted in uh, and to deal with their enemies. Uh, this is a, a, a time that, you know, everyone's going to be tested, believers and unbelievers alike. But there's a promise that we will be taken care of. Um, and so Jeremiah 30 discusses this. Um, jumping ahead, we've got Ezekiel 37, which people know as the dry bones prophecy. Um, but this this particular prophecy from Ezekiel actually is also a millennial kingdom prophecy. It's a thousand year reign prophecy. Um, in this passage, Ezekiel sees a vision of, you know, it's a valley of dry bones, and these bones are dead. There's no identity to them. There's no, there's nothing. They're dried. They're, they're dead. They've been dead for a very long time. And by the end of the passage, the bones are resurrected, and a life is breathed into them, and they become an army. And so this passage, the whole, you know, 37th chapter of Ezekiel, specifically verses 21 through 28, deal with um, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel and the millennial reign. And so it's another prophecy. And so we jump ahead, and then we're in the New Testament. So, so the New Testament, you would think that, you know, maybe this wouldn't be a thing, or at least some people teach that. But even in the New Testament, the disciples wanted to know about, you know, when this kingdom was coming. So in Acts 1 and 6, um, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? 
So this, if you read X1, X1 was very pivotal because it was, you know, X1 deals with the ascension of Christ. Um, it deals with essentially like an extension of the Great Commission because, you know, Christ tells his disciples, you know, just go out, you know, make disciples of all the world. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to have power once once it indwells you. But this passage always stuck out to me. Verse 6 is the disciples literally asking, you know, when is our kingdom coming? When are you going to restore us? This is what they wanted Christ to do the first time that he came. They wanted him to restore the kingdom of Israel. But at that time, he, he didn't come for that. He wanted to come to redeem us. Um, But even though Christ made this clear on several occasions, you know, even the disciples, those closest to him, didn't pick up on it. Now, the disciples in this passage are asking him again as he's getting ready to ascend back up to heaven. They ask him again, you know, when are you going to, you know, restore our kingdom? And I'm paraphrasing, but in verse 7, you know, the Messiah says, you know, essentially, don't worry about that right now. Go out and make disciples of the earth, um, you know, spread the gospel, so on and so forth. You're going to get the Holy Spirit, and when you get the Holy Spirit, you'll know what to do. And so the promise has always been there, Old and New Testament. And so we, our generation, is coming up on the uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy. This is this is what the end times is all about. It's the kingdom of Jacob versus the kingdom of Esau. And I, in some of my past teachings, I've said, you know, it's it's not about race. It's it's actually spiritual, you know, because you can be uh, part of the kingdom of Jacob and not be in his, you know, an Israelite or a Hebrew. Um, you just you have to, but you have to believe on the Messiah. You have to believe in Christ. Well, vice versa with Esau, it's the same thing. Like you know, you can be you know, essentially part of the kingdom of es Esau if you if you don't obey the God of the Bible. And so this is where we're at. This is what the war is about. This is why the Antichrist is coming. You know, he's coming because he essentially, he's trying to set up his kingdom to keep the kingdom of heaven from coming. And so that's what this is all about. Matthew 25, 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. So this has always been in the plan um, you know, the father has always wanted this. You know, he's always planned. He's never, he has never planned to leave us hanging. But I think sometimes, you know, in life, you know, we get so discouraged because we look at our circumstances or we look at, you know, what's going on, um, you know, around the world. And we, we forget that, you know, there's a divine plan and all of this is, you know, we're literally just... We literally just have to trust in him. We just have to trust in in God. But sometimes it's hard. Now, immediately after, uh, jumping ahead, immediately after the War of Armageddon, so I've, I've spoken to you at length about, um, the, you know, the tribulation period, and I said, you know, I, I've talked to you about predictive programming and all this stuff, and I've said, you know, all of it leads, all roads lead to the War of Armageddon. Um, anyone who takes the mark of the beast, um, it automatically enrolls them in the army that'll go up against the lamb. Um, and so this is, this is the end game. This is the end game is, is the, is war. Armageddon is the end game. So everything, all this anti-Christ, anti-God stuff that the world is pumping out, it's all about getting people to this side of where they hate the God of the Bible and they desire to um, have the Antichrist, the Satan, to be their God. And so this is what this is all about. But immediately after the War of Armageddon, we know that Christ will be victorious. Immediately after the War of Armageddon begins the thousand-year millennial reign. Now the saints here will be here on earth, but they will have glorified bodies and access to the tree of life. Christ will be on the throne and he will be our king. Now to summarize the the Israelites, so you know the people of the book, um 
they will play a role in judging the nations as part of the kingdom government under Christ. Christ will be the head, the center. And then those 12 apostles uh, will will rule with him. And then his tribes will be subdivisions. So the tribes, you know, 144,000, they will then govern everybody else. And it'll be a righteous kingdom. It's, it's, it's not like the our world. Uh, you know, our world, you know, we have people that take advantage of um of power and authority but this is not that if you make it into the kingdom uh you will be you will be treated well you won't be mistreated um now the scripture to back this up is um revelation 20 and 4 it says and i saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus and the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So those people on the thrones um, are actually the, the, the twelve. Those are the twelve, uh, again, the governing body that will govern with Christ during his thousand years. Of course, we know that the twelve tribes would be under those twelve men, those 12 disciples. And so then the 12 tribes would further, you know, give authority, you know, and, and govern throughout the kingdom. Um, another passage that backs up Revelation 24 is Matthew 19. So Matthew 19, it says, Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. And then where there... And then... What then will there be for us? So Peter wants to know, you know, we're following you. We're probably going to lose our lives. Um, you know, Peter was married. He had a family. Most of this, the, the disciples did. Um, a lot of them were businessmen. Uh, you know, Peter was a fisherman. They left their lives behind to follow, to follow Christ. Verse 28 says, And then Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne and also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So right there, Christ is telling Peter, you're going to reign and rule with me. If you truly follow me, if you truly follow me and do my bidding and do what I've set out for you to do, then I have this for you. You will reign and rule with me. And so Matthew nineteen twenty eight or Matthew nineteen twenty seven both line up with Revelation twenty and four. Now you may ask, okay, so you know, you might ask, you know, why? You know, I had somebody that asked asked me the other day. You know. Why is this happening? And, 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 you know, what's Christ's authority during the thousand year reign? Um, well, Isaiah 22 gives us gives us an example. So um, in Isaiah 22, you know, Christ has been given all authority. We know that. But this is a passage that backs it up. Isaiah 22, 21 says, And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house." So right there, Isaiah is, is, is telling you, you know, all authority has been given to Christ. He's been given the keys to Jerusalem and Judah. Um, this is his house. Nobody's going to push him out of it. Nobody's going to stop it. So it's in prophecy that this is happening. Um, there's nothing that the enemy can do to stop this, and it's inevitable, but he's trying his best. Now, Matthew 2, 4 through 6 kind of does the same thing. It also supports Isaiah 22, 21. In Matthew, it says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Ju Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And though Bethlehem in the land of Judah 
art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor and shall rule my people Israel. So again, there is there's another passage telling you, okay, Christ is going to rule rule the people. He's going to rule the people. Now, if you are grafted in with Israel, or if you are an Israelite that's been regrafted in, meaning you've accepted Christ, then you are going to experience a righteous governor. Christ is going to be good to you. It, you don't have anything to worry about. However, if you don't accept Christ, he is going to rule you with an iron scepter. Now, during the thousand-year reign, um, a lot's going to happen. Um, I've got just about 10, 10 more minutes. Um, I won't finish tonight, but I'm, I want to get you to a point to where you can kind of see where I'm going. And then we'll... Um, We'll catch up. I'm going to try to possibly do a Sabbath teaching on Friday, depending on kind of what happens. But um, two verses give us some insight on um, on this. Okay, so regarding the Iron Scepter, again, this is for people that do not make it into the kingdom. So people, um, you know, people will be alive after the War of Armageddon. The, the, the world will go on. There are some preachers and some ministries that teach that the world ends at Armageddon, uh, that's actually erroneous. The The world does not end at Armageddon. The, the world keeps going. Um, however, there's a, there's a distinction or separation um, between the two groups of people um, after the Battle of Armageddon. And some movies may give you, give you a concept. So like movies like Mad Max... The Book of Eli and stuff like that, films that deal with uh, post-apocalyptic, you know, like there's been a big war and the population's decimated and so on and so forth. That's what that is. That's predictive programming. Uh, again, it's from the enemy. There's some truth to it. Um, but again, it's not the full truth because it's not the word of God. And so um, when you see pictures like that where people are scraping it and, you know, they're, you know, they're scavengers and they're dirty and that's an example of what life will be like for the people that are outside of the kingdom who do not, who do not make it in. And so there's a whole, there's a whole kingdom coming to earth for a thousand years. Uh, again, this is before we get to heaven. We'll be here on earth. That's what it means by the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, there's, there's a lot more to it, but people get hung up and they, they just teach, okay, you die and then you go straight to heaven or straight to hell. And, and there's, there's actually there's there's something that happens before that. So, Revelation two, two chapter two verse twenty seven and Psalms two and one gives us a kind of a breakdown on on what the iron scepter is all about. Okay, it says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken into pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. Okay, so this passage links with Psalms two and nine. To understand the meaning of this quote, we have to read Psalms 2 in its entirety. So let's read that. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their feather, fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Okay, so the context of this is that um, you have to look at what the psalmist is saying. He's, he's describing the circumstances on what this happens. Okay, so first, all the nations of, of the earth are in an uproar. They are conspiring in vanity to challenge the authority of God himself. The kings of the earth are working together against the Messiah, the anointed God of the Bible. They desire to rob him of his power to rule over them. So these are not believers. 
this 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 is the p- picture it's painting. These these people do not believe in the God of the Bible. They are unbelievers. They are set against the Lord's authority, and they are prideful, sinful at heart, and they are seeking to rebel. Meanwhile, the Lord is scoffing at them because he knows that their plans are pathetic. They're going to end in defeat. He's going to have power over the earth. He already does. When it says that the Lord promises to speak to them in anger and in fury, that's saying that he's going to deny them a victory by installing the Messiah as king of the earth in Jerusalem on his holy mountain. So all the earth will be Christ's possession. I mean, it already is, but he's going to physically take this earth at the end of all this. This is what this is all about. So any rebellion will get put down. It'll be shattered. Um... This is this is the millennial kingdom. And again, if if you are in Christ, if you've accepted him, if you've you know, if, if you're walking with with God, you have nothing to worry about. But if you are revolting against God, living a life contrary to to, you know, what his word says, this this is what you have to look forward to. Um there are some other passages where um, it talks about people being sold into slavery. Um, this book is going to balance. The Bible balances out. People don't want to hear that. You know, we live in a world where people just don't want to hear this. It's it's not um, popular to talk about this. But the, these books will balance. This is what this is all about. This is what all the stuff with the climate change and CBDC and... Uh, mass surveillance everywhere, um, all the stuff with net neutrality. This is what it's all about. It's all a war against the God of the Bible. But it ends in defeat for those who are not with him, who are not on his side. All right, I'm just going to touch on one more thing, and then we'll wrap for tonight. We'll resume hopefully this weekend. All right, so there will be some that make it through the Battle of Armageddon and the tribulation that will attempt to hide in order to avoid worshiping Christ. Okay, so um, I've spoken before on Revelation 6 as well as Isaiah 2. I've I've talked about um, uh, smart cities and ghost cities, and I've spoken about um, 15-minute cities uh, underground bunkers, and I've I've told you these things from the standpoint of um, like a a pre battle of Armageddon attempt to escape judgment. That is true. These passages do relate to the time leading up to. Um, the Battle of Armageddon. However, these passages also refer to life during the millennial reign. So there will be people, great men of the earth, even just local yokels that are left alive after the Battle of Armageddon. And the ones that, of course, aren't aren't saved, you know, that aren't with his, Jacob, Israel, they will try to, to run. They'll try to keep from hiding and worship and giving tribute to the King of Kings. Revelation six fifteen through 17 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth, at, sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. So that tells you he's going to be on the throne. He's going to be on his throne in Jerusalem. And these are people that are going to be hiding. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Again, it's frightening. They don't want to hear, see, worship, anything. They just want to be left alone. They, they, you know, they don't want to have anything to do with this this Messiah. Isaiah two nineteen says, "And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty." when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So again, he's coming to establish order. He's coming to sit on the throne. He's coming to balance, you know, these these books, this book is going to balance. I keep saying that. 
there will be people that'll that'll hide in an in an attempt to keep from worshiping him. All right, so we're out of time. Let me just uh I'm going to touch on just one more thing and then you know, we'll pick up pick back up with this later. Okay. So, um it's it's going to take it'll take 7 years to destroy all the weapons. Um involved in that war against Armageddon, all the weapons that are going to be used against uh, the Messiah and his, his saints, there's going to be, it's going to be seven years of burning those weapons. And it's going to take seven years to, to bury all the bodies from the slaughter at the battle of Armageddon. We'll talk more about that next, next time. And I'll, I'll break that down for you some more. All right. So, um, Next time, next time we'll talk more about that. We'll talk. We'll also talk about the first resurrection and the second death, um, because there is um, a lot of people think that harpazo or or rapture is is a is a separate event that comes before all this. But the the, the Bible only speaks about a first resurrection. And you'll find that First Thessalonians four sixteen, which is the, the verse that's used for Harpazo. That's a uh, First Thessalonians four sixteen. The verse that's used for Harpazo or Rapture is actually uh, also mentioned in Revelation twenty and six, and it's it's called the first resurrection. So we'll talk about that and how that's different from what the. Um, Roman Catholic Church and and the Protestant Church teaches um cuz it's it's a lot different there is a um there's of course there's a second exodus that's that's about to that's going to occur soon um but there's some confusion about the first resurrection so I want to talk to you more about that again we're out of time but uh we will resume with that next time and I'll talk to you a little bit about the battle what you know what to expect afterwards and then um, we'll get into um, the prophecy concerning the seven women to one man and the war of Gog and Magog uh, next time.